All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm gonna start actually because it's like nine oh three already. Um, okay. So what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, we're actually ahead in recitation, so we're actually ahead of lecture, I think. Uh, so in lecture tomorrow, I believe you will look at like the Jordan, like the case where systems of equations have like Jordan form. So A is like defective or if A has complex eigenvalues, which is what we covered last week in recitation. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, in that case, we're ahead. So I guess today we just have a lot of time to talk about like just random stuff. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna talk about variation parameters, uh, and then we're gonna talk about just a few other like systems kind of things that will probably help you with this recitation homework for next week. Uh, in terms of the exam, uh, I guess I'll cover that at the end. Uh, since no one's here right now. So we'll talk about the exam in a bit. So let's just jump in to uh, variation parameters. So we're going backwards here. Uh, going back to chapter 8.7. Uh, so we're solving just constant coefficient Diffie Qs again. So for variation parameters to work, uh, you need to consider the following differential equation. Oh, wait. I don't have anything set up. What the hell? Okay. So, I'm slipping. Uh, let's get this. I, I've written, like, nothing on my screen yet, so we're good. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So, we need to consider... Uh, this following differential equation, uh, y double prime, uh, or not y double prime, so y to the n uh, plus a1, y to the n minus 1, plus all the way down to a to the n, a n minus 1, y plus a n is equal to some right-hand side f of x, right? So the important thing to note here is that, uh, the constant in front of your leading term or your highest derivative is one. And so if that's the case, then this uh, variation parameter method will be able to work. Okay. So what's the following? Uh, we can find a particular solution to this Diffie here. All right. Uh, and to find a particular solution then, how to do it, the idea is the following, yp is equal to u1y1 plus u2y2 plus all the way down to unyn, where y1 through yn are solutions to the homogeneous differential equation. Right, so up here you have this differential equation that's non-homogeneous, but you can solve the homogeneous first and then take the homogeneous solutions and use that as a guess for your particular solution. All right, so once you have that, uh, in class you then derive like a system of equations. So then you solve the system of equations, uh, which is you put in all your homogeneous solutions, y1, y2, through yn, and you take derivatives until you get a square matrix, right? So you'll have y1 prime, and then all the way down to y1 nth derivative, and then you'll have like y2 prime, right, yn prime, and then you'll take derivatives all the way down to yn to the nth derivative, right? So you have this system of equations, and then your unknown vector here will be u1 prime, u2 prime, all the way down to un prime. So you're not solving for u1 and u2 explicitly. You actually solve for their derivatives. And then on the right-hand side, you'll have uh, your vector be all zeros except for the last entry where you'll have f of x. Okay. So this is the idea behind variation parameters. We solve for u1 prime, u2 prime, and then we can find u1 and u2, which means then we can find yp, which then means we can find the general solution. Okay, so let's take a look at that through an example. 
so let's say we want to find uh, y double prime minus 6y prime plus 9y is equal to 4 e to the 3x ln x. Right. So remember, the variation parameters method only finds us a particular solution. And therefore, uh, if we want to find the entire general solution, we have to solve for the homogeneous first, and et cetera. And this is very similar to using annihilators. Right? So recall the four-step method for annihilators. Uh, that we used in solving annihilators, we're going to use it to solve these kinds of difficulties as well. So step one was to find the homogeneous, right? Find yh. So in that case, we have y double prime minus 6y prime plus 9y is equal to zero. Okay, and then, uh, so this is really easy to find. You get r minus three squared times e is rt is equal to zero. And so r is equal to three with multiplicity two. So your homogeneous solution is c1 e to the three t, or x. So this is rx. So you get c1 e to the three x uh, plus c2 x e to the three x as your homogeneous, right? Nothing new here at all. Okay, so step two is then to guess the particular solution. And in our case, right, remember for variation parameters, our guess is yp is equal to u1y1 plus u2y2. So what are y1 and y2? And in our case, e to the 3x is, be, is going to be y1, and x e to the 3x is going to be y2, right? Because remember, y1 and y2 are solutions to the homogeneous, and here we have two solutions to the homogeneous, uh, which we already solved, all right? So yp is going to be u1 e to the 3x plus u2 x e to the 3x. Okay, so that's step two. Step three in this four-step process was to actually find uh, the coefficients on yp. Okay, and to find the coefficients on a particular solution, we have to turn to that system of equations that we had uh, above, right? So remember, this system of equations uh, up here we're going to set it up now for the coefficients on yp. And so how do we do that? Well, we create our matrix, right, our system. So we put in y1 first, which is e to the 3x. And then we put in y2, which is x e to the 3x, right? And then we have to take derivatives until you get a square matrix, right? And so here, uh, this is 3 e to the 3x. And then if you take the derivatives over here, using product rule, you'll get 1 plus 3x e to the 3x. All right. Our unknown vector is going to be u1 prime and u2 prime. And then our right-hand side right, is going to be all zeros and then f of x. So in our case, 1, 0. And then f of x was the right-hand side equation, which is 4 e to the 3x ln x. So that's the system that we have. All right, uh, so how do we solve the system? Well, we do it normally. So we put it in our augmented matrix, and then we just row reduce, and we can find our constants, uh, our unknowns. So here, e to the 3x, x e to the 3x, 3 e to the 3x, 1 plus 3x e to the 3x. Uh, that parentheses in the wrong spot. All right, and then now we have the augmented matrix line, right? And then you have zero, four e to the three x ln x, right, as our system. 
All right, and recall, and just to keep in mind, our unknowns are u1 prime and u2 prime. All right, so now we reduce. Uh, divide everything. So I'm going to divide the first row by e to the 3x. I'm going to divide the second row by e to the 3x. And so what I get is I get 1, x, 0. And then on the bottom, I get 3, 1 plus 3x. And now the right-hand side becomes 4lnx, right, by dividing everything through by e to the 3x. Okay? And then what? So now, right, row reduce until you get, like, row echelon form or something that has the pivots exposed. So if I do uh, row 2 minus 3 times row 1, so still I have 1x0. And then now I get 3 minus 3, which is 0. And then I get 1, mi 1 plus 3x minus 3x, which is 1. And then my right-hand side stays the same. And now we're able to solve for our, our unknowns. Right. So from the second row, from row 2, I get that u2 prime is equal to 4 ln x. All right. And then from row 1, I get uh, u1 prime plus u2 prime, or plus x u2 prime. It's equal to zero, uh, and it's actually more useful for us to write it as u1 prime is equal to negative x times u2 prime. Well, what is u2 prime actually? u2 prime is 4 ln x, so this is negative 4 x ln x. All right, any questions up to here? All right, and then so what's the next step? Next step is just to actually solve for these, uh, is to integrate and find u1 and u2. So uh, let's integrate u2 first. Uh, so the integral of u2 prime is equal to the integral of 4 ln x. And that's easy. Um, so you should, you should have the integral of just ln x memorized. Uh, technically, you have to do it by parts. But this is going to be 4 x ln x minus x. All right, now we want to do the integral of u1 prime, which is the integral of negative 4x ln x. And this integral is a lot more annoying. So uh, that's negative 4 times the integral of x ln x. And so now let's integrate x ln x by parts. Uh, how are we going to do this? So let, d, let u equal ln x. Here we're going to let u equal ln x. So du is going to be 1 over x dx. dv is going to be x dx. And then v is going to be x squared over 2. Okay. And so now that's negative 4 times... And then remember, uh, integration by parts is uv minus vdu, the integral of vdu. So uv is x squared over 2 ln x minus the integral of vdu, which is x squared over 2 times 1 over x. So that's just x over 2 dx. And so now uh, we get negative 4 x squared over 2 ln x, and then the integral of x over 2 is x squared over 4. All right, so uh, this is u1, and this is u2. So we found u1 and u2. Okay, so now what? So now we write down our yp, right? Remember, which was u1 e to the 2, 3x plus u2 x e to the 3x. And then now this is u1 times uh, negative 4. 
So actually, let's simplify this a little bit. This is really x squared minus 2x squared ln x. So u1 times, uh, so that's x squared minus 2x squared ln x times e to the 3x plus u2, which was 4x ln x minus x, 4x ln x minus 4x, uh, x e to the 3x. So I distributed the 4 for u2. All right, what is that equal to? Uh, we get x squared e to the 3x minus 2x squared uh, e to the 3x ln x plus 4x squared uh, e to the 3x ln x minus 4x squared e to the 3x. Okay, and then combining like terms, first term and the last term have the same root and then these two terms can be combined. Um, we get 2x squared e to the 3x ln x minus 3x squared e to the 3x. So that's my particular solution. All right, and then step four of this four-step process was to find the homogeneous, uh, to find the general solution, which is y, a, y. And so the general solution is equal to the homogeneous plus the particular solution. And so in our case, y is going to be c1 e to the 3x plus c2 x e to the 3x plus this yp stuff up here that we just found, 2x squared e to the 3x ln x minus 3x squared e to the 3x. Okay, any questions? So really, the downside of this is that uh, you're integrating a lot, but it does allow us to find uh, particular solutions uh, pretty nicely. Uh, and in fact, this is a lot better than the annihilator method, right? Because this, the variation parameter method is analogous to the annihilator method in the steps that we take, but the annihilator method we're never gonna be able to annihilate that ln x term on the right hand side because we just don't know what a dilator for ln x is. Um, so yeah, so that's why the variation parameters method is better. Few things to point out. Number one, when I took the integral here, why is there no constant of integration? So why is there no constant integration with that integral? So if you looked at reduction of order, every time we integrated, we needed a constant. Yeah. Because that constant could have just gotten full zero when we got tied to the homogeneous solution? Uh, yeah, so that's one way to think about it, right? So if we had a plus C here, um, then down here, this would have been like plus C, right? And then if you distribute it, you get a C either the 3x, which is the homogeneous solution, and then just gets eaten up by the homogeneous, right? That's one way to think about it. Um, the other way to think about it is, uh, what are we finding here when we're doing all this integration? Like, yeah, we're finding a particular solution, right? What are we finding when we integrate everything in the reduction of order stuff? General the general solution, right? So the particular solution, in particular, has no unknown constants, or since it's a particular solution, you have multiple particular solutions, right? So we can really just set that constant of integration equal to zero. Um, so that's one way to think about it. Uh, so this constant of integration here is equal to zero, but in reduction of order, right, uh, you can't set the constant of integration equal to zero because it's the unknown constant for your homogeneous part. All right, so that's gonna be the difference between the integration here and the integration of reduction of order. Um, if you leave the constant of integration in, again, it's not going to matter because at the end, you'll realize that it just gets eaten up by the homogeneous regardless. Um, but just to keep that in mind, uh, if you want to play it safe, put the constant in. But for here, you don't have to put the constant in. All right. Uh, another thing. So this uh, method uh, seems to be inferior to reduction of order, right? Because here... Uh, we can only find the 
we can only find the particular solution. And the second thing is that we need to know the entire homogeneous solution before we can even work with variation parameters, right? So remember step one was to actually find the entire homogeneous. So why would we ever use variation parameters over a reduction of order? So if reduction of order seems like a vastly superior method than this, why would you ever use this method? Any ideas? Yeah, so this one's a little better in the sense that like reduction of order, you might need to like, because if once you have like the first order if EQ, you might like need to like integrate that by parts on the right hand side, and then you might need to integrate by parts again mm -hmm. to get your actual solution, right? Uh, so that might happen. Uh, so that's one benefit, maybe. Here, technically, you had to integrate by parts twice as well, because U2 prime, technically, you have to integrate that by parts, but uh, you should just know what that integral is. Um, so yeah, that's one way to think about it. So another way to think about why you would use variation parameters over reduction of order is what we talked about at the beginning, is that variation parameters generalizes to nth order. right? So what happens when you generalize the nth order, you just have a bigger matrix, or you just have a bigger system of equations to solve. But uh, that's fine because, like, say we have a third order diff EQ. What happens if I do reduction of order on the third order diff EQ? You get a second order. You get a second order diff EQ. And I got to use reduction of order again on that second order diff EQ, right? So variation parameter is actually really nice for higher order diff EQs because if you can find the homogeneous solution, you don't have to do any BS with like doing reduction of order twice, right? You can just plug it into the system, get your particular, if you know the homogeneous, you're done, right? So that's an advantage of variation parameters is for like higher order, like third order or above diff EQs. So the next example, we're actually gonna take a look at a third order diff EQ. Um, this is actually a book example. So I'm just gonna set it up and like not do any of like the tedious computations. Um, you can work through it if you want on your own, but just to see how do we use reduction of uh, use variation parameters for our third order example? So this is on page 554 um, of your book. It's also just a pain in the ass to come up with third order diff EQs, um, which is why we're going to go with a book example. So consider uh, y triple prime minus 3y double prime plus 3y prime minus y is equal to 36 e to the x ln x. Okay, so how do you factor the right hand side? Uh, it's like a it's like a binomial like coefficient kind of thing. Uh, so what we're gonna see is that this is just r minus one cubed e to the rt is equal to zero. So this is the step one homogeneous. Um, you actually get a triple root on the left hand side, and so r is equal to one one one. So yh is going to be, uh, this should be an x, not a t. Uh, you're going to get c1 e to the x plus c2, x e to the x plus c3, x squared e to the x. Okay, step two is to guess your variation parameters particular. So that's u1 e to the x plus u2 x e to the x plus u3 x squared e to the x. All right, so this is y1, that's y2, and that's y3. And then you just plug them in to step two. All right, step three is the system of equations that we want to set up, right? And so that's like the big thing with various parameters is setting up the system of equations. So how do we do it? Um, above, we kind of like went through this T step of like we did this intermediate step here. You can kind of skip that and just jump straight to the, uh, the augmented system. So let's do that. 
Um, so our solutions are y1, which is e to the x, y2, which is x e to the x, and y3, which is x squared e to the x. Right? And then, uh, now what do we want to do? Well, we want to take derivatives until our matrix is a square matrix. So in particular, we need to take two derivatives of each term. Uh, so let's take derivatives of e to the x. It's really easy. Just e to the x and e to the x. All right, and now we want to take derivatives of x e to the x. All right, uh, so product rule, you'll get 1 plus x e to the x for that derivative. And then you want to take another derivative. Um, and by product rule, again, this actually ends up being 2 plus x e to the x. All right, now x squared e to the x, uh, again, so we want to product rule this, you'll get um, 2x plus x squared e to the x as the first derivative, and then taking the derivative again, um, using product rule, you'll get uh, 2 plus 4x plus x squared times e to the x. Okay. And then on the right-hand side, uh, remember how we set up our right-hand sides for variation parameters. It's just zeros for every row and, except for the last row. So we'll get 0, 0, and then f of x, which is 36 e to the x ln x. Okay. And then we reduce this matrix. Um, so now we can divide everything out by e to the x. So you have to leave like your e to the x terms in before dividing out by them. So now if we divide everything, every row by e to the x, we actually get 1x x squared, 1, 1 plus x, 2x plus x squared, and then 1, 2 plus x, 2 plus 4x plus x squared, and then remember to divide the right-hand side by e to the x as well. So you'll get 36 ln x on the right-hand side. Okay, and then we reduce this even more, uh, and this actually reduces really nicely. So you get 1x x squared, 0, and then you'll get 0, 1, 2x, 0, and then 0, 0, 1, 18 ln x uh, once you reduce it all the way. Okay, so, you, so this system of equations is not bad to solve at all, right? Uh, so from row 3, you get u3 prime is equal to 18 ln x. Um, and then you'll eventually be able to deduce, uh, again, we're not gonna, we're gonna do this very broadly as an overview. u2 prime is gonna be 36 x ln x, negative 36 x ln x. And then u1 prime is gonna be 18 x squared ln x. And then you can integrate those by parts. Um, u3, ends up being 18 x ln x minus x. So remember the parentheses there. Uh, U2 by parts, uh, you'll get 9 x squared times 1 minus 2 ln x. And then U1, you'll get 2 x cubed, uh, 3 ln x minus 1. All right, so that's what you get. But the main goal, again, was to show how you actually set it up for a third order. The calculations are just calculations. You just have to do them. OK. Any, any questions? Yeah, so that's it then for differential equations. So um, the types of differential equations that we need to know how to solve for the exam so ODEs on the exam. Uh, you're going to get the following, right? So the first one, right, you need to be able to solve homogeneous ODEs. And then there's three cases. The first one being uh, real distinct roots. Uh, the second case being real repeated roots, 
Uh, the third case being complex roots. Right, so that's going to be, that's the homogeneous stuff you need to know. And then the second part then is, okay, so how do we find particular solutions? Well, you can use the annihilator method. Right, and then the second method that we can learn, which is today, is the variation of parameters method um, to find particular solutions, right? And remember, this is like the four-step process um, that we use. Okay, and it, it's important to note that the variation parameters method is generally better than the annihilator method because uh, there are only certain things we can annihilate, right? So like the LNX stuff, you can't annihilate. So this is a uh, more general, or I guess flexible might be like a better word to say it. Um, you just have more options with variation of parameters. All right, and then the third type of equations um, that you want to solve then is the general solution. Uh, so there are a few ways to do it. So the f first way you can do it is to find the homogeneous plus the particular solution. So you can do them separately and to get the general solution. Or the second method of doing it is just to use reduction of order, which straight up gets you uh, the general solution without needing to worry about what's a particular and what's a homogeneous. All right. And then encompassing all of this is going to be the uh, spring mass stuff. So the spring mass is just going to be like a certain application in one of these things, right? Because all spring masses is just an ODE where like the coefficients have certain names attached to them. Um, but you will need to know like under damped, over damped, critically damped, um, that kind of stuff. Um, but everything else is just like, oh, like the coefficient in front of Y prime is called the spring constant or something like that, right? Um, so. That's all it is. Okay, so that's all for ODEs. Um, so what now? So let's go back to systems of ODEs and talk about a few things. So what I really want to talk about is the relationship between the matrix exponential and um, solutions to the ODEs, uh, solution and, and solutions to x prime is equal to ax. Right. So there's actually a pretty close link between the two. Um, <laughs> first of all, being that the columns of the matrix exponential are actually like three linear, like li the columns of a matrix exponential are linearly independent solutions to x prime is equal to ax. Um, but uh, let's talk about something else first. So, so the first relation that we're gonna talk about, and this one's important, um, uh, to the point where it's on your recitation homework for this week is that an initial value problem, x prime is equal to ax, and then you have um, x evaluated at zero is equal to just some constant vector of x's. So we call that x naught. So if you have x prime is equal to ax, and you have x at zero is equal to x naught, um, is solved by x is equal to e to the a t x naught. Okay, so you can solve initial value problems just by finding the matrix exponential and multiplying it by the initial condition vector. So let's take a look, look, take a look at an example of this. So consider the system uh, x1 prime is equal to negative 2x1 plus x2. x2 prime is equal to negative 2x2 plus x3. x3 prime is equal to negative 2x3 
and x4 prime is equal to negative 2x4. All right, and we're going to have initial condition where x1 or x1, x2, x3, x4 evaluated at 0. All right, so x1 at 0 is going to be 1, x2 at 0 is going to be 1, x3 at 0 is going to be 2, and x4 at 0 is going to be 1. All right, so you have a system and then you have some initial conditions. All right, so let's set this up then in, a, in the vector notation form. So you have x1 prime, x2 prime, x3 prime, x4 prime is equal to, and then let's just read off the coefficients here. So this is going to be negative 2, 1, and then this is like 0, negative 2, 1, 0, and then you have a negative 2 for x3, and then you have a negative <coughs> 2 for x4. Right, and then that's multiplied by x1, x2, x3, x4. Right, so that's your x prime is equal to ax form. And then finally, x vector evaluated at 0 is 1, 1, 2, 1, as given in the problem above. Right, so this is where we start doing our work. All right, so one thing you can do is you can look at a right and you can just go find the eigenvalues eigenvectors uh, and you know find find the initial value condition that way right by plugging in zero and then solving for the unknown constants um, but what is the a matrix here Jordan. yeah it's a Jordan block matrix right so we know how to take exponentials of Jordan block matrices right uh, if you recall, if you don't, hopefully this will be a memory jogger. But, right, so this is A, and notice, hey, look, that's a 3 by 3 block, and that's a 1 by 1 block, right? So we can find E to the AT, right? In this case, since it's a Jordan block matrix, E to the AT is just like E to the JT, or it looks like E to the JT. So how are we going to do this? Well... We're going to have a 3 by 3 block. We're going to have a 1 by 1 block. Um, so on the diagonal, right, this is e to the negative 2t, e to the negative 2t, e to the negative 2t, and e to the negative 2t. All right, but now, right, that's a 3 by 3 block, and this is a 1 by 1 block. So when we take the matrix exponential, we need to fill out our blocks. So above the diagonal here, in this big red block, we're going to do t e to the negative 2t, t e to the negative 2t. All right. And then finally, in the top right corner, we actually know what this is as well. It's t squared over 2 factorial uh, e to the 2t, or e to the negative 2t. Right, so we know what that exponential is, right? So we can just straight up find it. And now, what can I do now? Well, remember, x is just equal to a to e to the at x naught. So that's just this matrix times the x naught vector, which is 1, 1, 2, 1. So what is that equal to? Well, now we just take uh, a product. So this is going to be e to the negative 2t plus t e to the negative 2t plus t squared e to the negative 2t. All right. And then the next entry is going to be e to the negative 2t plus 2t e to the negative 2t. And then the next entry when we multiply that out, is going to be 2 e to the negative 2t. And then the last entry will be e to the negative 2t. All right, and we're done. That's it. Because uh, of our relationship here, x is equal to e to the at x naught, solves the initial value condition. And essentially, all of our unknown coefficients are just immediately solved 
just by taking the matrix exponential and multiplying by um, x naught. So what are the caveats here? Uh, this only worked because this initial A matrix was already in Jordan form. So if it wasn't in Jordan form, you would actually have to go through, find the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, find either the AT. Uh, but at that point, you might as well have just, you know, set up the unknown coefficients and solved it that way. Right? But if it is in Jordan form, or if it's diagonal, then we know how to do it, right? You can just find the exponential, like, super quickly. Um, so that's why this works. Okay, any questions about this first relation between solutions and exponentials? All right, what's the second relation? If you have, okay, so if you have, like, So let's say we have a solution to x prime equals ax, right? Um, and it's like the following. We have x is equal to c1 e to the lambda t v1 plus c2 e to the lambda t right v2 plus etc. right? So when you have this combination, um, what can we do? First, we can define this big matrix called x of t, which is the following. It's going to be e to the lambda t, or e to the lambda 1 t v1, e to the lambda 2 t v2, et cetera, e to the lambda n t v n, right? So you have e to the lambda t times a vector, and you just put that in the first column. And you have e to the lambda t times another vector, and you just put that in the second column, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So instead of writing them out as a linear combination, you just put them into columns. Right? So you can define this big X. It's called a fundamental matrix. Right? It's called the fundamental matrix um, of a system. And I should also note that this relationship uh, is pretty much optional to know. Um, the first one, you do need to know that. All right, so you can define this matrix, and now what? Now e to the at is actually equal to xt times x0 inverse, right? Because if you plug in 0 for t into that matrix, uh, you'll just get a matrix of constants, right? And then if you invert it, you'll be able to just get uh, e to the at. Okay, so why does this work? Well, if you notice, um, I mean, there's a few. The book has a proof. I'm not going to do a formal proof. If you want to see one, uh, we can actually just talk about this in office hours or after class. But, all right, so uh, let's see an example of this working then. All right, so for example, let's say I have the following um, I have x prime. equals ax, uh, or x prime is equal to uh, 4, negative 8, 2, uh, actually, that's wrong, 6, negative 8, 2, negative 2, times x. Okay, and let's say I know the solution. We know that x is equal to c1, e to the 2t times 4, 2, plus c2 e to the 2t times t times 4, 2, plus 1, 0. All right, so let's say you just know that solution already. Um, you can actually find it from the system. It's a defective matrix, right? Uh, so since it's a defective matrix, you need to find a cycle of generalized eigenvectors. And so this is essentially your cycle right here. Uh, and then from last week, we know how to put together the solutions to defective matrices, um, which is like this. All right, so now let's find e to the at. 
Well, what is e to the at? e to the at is equal to uh, x of t times x not inverse, or x of 0 inverse, right? So what is x of t? Well, we look at our vectors, right? This is e to the something v1, and this is e to the something v2. So if you actually multiply it out, the first column is actually 4e to the 2t and 2e to the 2t. Right, we can see that. Uh, I just distributed the e to the 2t into that first vector. All right, over here, this vector is really 4t plus 1 and 2t. Right, if I multiply it out and add everything up. So now I have 4t plus 1 e to the 2t, and uh, what is it? This is 2t e to the 2t. Right, so this is x of t. So what is x0 of t? Well, now you plug in 0 into t. And what happens? Well, all the e to the whatever terms become 1. Right? And then you have the remainder. So you have 4, 2. This is 0 plus 1. So that's 1. And then down here, that's just 0 because it's 2 times 0. And now you get 4, 2, 1, 0. But do we know what 4, 2, 1, 0 is? And yes, you know that this is your second solution up here. It's the, it's the S matrix, right? Because you have your generalized eigenvector, which is 1, 0, and then you have 4, 2, which is your eigenvector. So this is actually the S matrix, right? Um, so what does that mean? That means x not inverse which is um, using the determinant method, negative 1 half times, uh, now you get 0, 4, negative 2, negative 1. So that's 0, 1 half, 1, negative 2. Right? That means x not inverse is equal to s inverse. All right? Does anyone want to take a wild stab at what x of t is? It's e to the jt, but there's something else there. This is actually equal to s e to the jt. Right? Because now, right, e to the at is equal to s e to the jt s inverse, which is exactly what we've seen before. OK? So now, with all this in mind, we can find e to the at, which is 4 e to the 2t, 4t plus 1 e to the 2t, 2 e to the 2t, 2t e to the 2t times 0, 1 half, 1, negative 2. And so e to the at ends up being 4t plus 1 e to the 2t, negative 8t e to the 2t, 2t e to the 2t, 1 minus 4t e to 2t. All right. Uh, that's it. Any questions? OK, so uh, exam stuff, as I'm going to hand out the rest of the um, So uh, it's on Monday at 6.30, so it's the same time, same place. It's in Chem 102. Uh, we haven't written the exam yet, but What's going to be on the exam? Uh, it's going to be all sections. So uh, chapter 8 and all of chapter 9, except and then uh, 8.4, which is, I think, complex value trial. Um, 8.6, so whatever complex value trial is. 
uh, 8.6, which is RLC circuits. Uh, and then 9.9. .9. Actually, I don't know what 9.6 and 9.7 are, so probably not those. And then 9.9 .9 and 9.10, which are like phase plane systems or phase portraits. So these are not on the exam. But everything else from chapter 8 is going to be on the exam. And everything from chapter 9 is going to be on the exam. So essentially what that covers is a bunch of Diffie Qs and a bunch of systems of Diffie Qs. And that's going to be comprised of uh, your midterm. Um, we don't know how long it is uh, because we haven't written it yet. Um, so I have office hours today from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, I also have them on Friday, but I'm going to probably extend office hours and have more over the weekend. Uh, I'll try to grade homework by tomorrow. So uh, we're a little bit behind, but I'm going to spend the rest of today just grading homeworks. And then I'll tell you when you can like pick them up, um, pick homeworks up. Uh, yeah, so sometime tomorrow or Friday. And then what else? Uh, as for review sessions, uh, the three TAs, probably we're just going to hold one review session uh, for all of us. Because the idea is uh, if we hold three separate review sessions, you're just going to see us do three reduction of order problems with different like coefficients. So it's probably not worth it to like do that. Uh, so we'll have details about that uh, later in the week as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if we're gonna do that. That's that's why I meant by I don't think we're gonna do like three separate review uh, sessions because it's essentially like we're doing Diffie Qs with different coefficients, yeah. but it's the same methods. So. Yeah. All right, and then recitation homework is probably going to be the same thing as we do always uh, on exam weeks. It's going to be due the Friday, um, but it might be a good idea to take a look at this because it, everything on here is going to be on your exam. And a lot of things that are homework, um, on the homework due two weeks from now is going to be on your exam as well. So we're actually ahead of the homework schedule. You can actually get done with a lot of the homeworks. Um, all right, that's all I have.